Good evening, everybody. This is uh, Dr. Kurt Wohler. I appreciate you joining me um, for this webinar recording titled Function and Multiple Sclerosis. Um, there's going to be some good information for you here, and we'll, uh, we'll try to get through things uh, succinctly for you. For those of you who have joined me on webinars before, um, you know that I am very much into education. I think patient education is critical. Um, to understanding your own particular uh, disorder, whatever that might be. Um, with respect to this presentation, we're obviously talking about multiple sclerosis. I've created a tremendous amount of information online. Um, I also have an interactive website. Uh, it's called askthedoctor-ms.com. What this is, is a direct access to me through a question and answer forum um, essentially unlimited access. So you can join this month to month if you wish. You can ask questions through the forum. We also have access to, to professional information, supplements, resources, videos, articles, etc. So if there are questions you have with respect to multiple sclerosis, particularly in the avenue of integrative medicine, dietary intervention, supplement therapy, um, medication treatment, etc., this is a great place uh, to learn about that and ask me those questions through that website. So that that information can be found at askthedoctor-ms.com. I also have my main website. If you want to learn more about me, my consultation services, etc., places that I'm speaking, you can access information through drwoller.com. So let's get into our presentation, what we're going to talk about. I've talked before about stress and how it influences hormone problems. I'm going to introduce that concept again tonight. Talk about chronic stress because when we talk about low thyroid, it's not just about the thyroid being deficient. Other systems in the body create an imbalance in the thyroid and that we have to understand. So we'll talk about the chronic stress response. We'll link it to thyroid problems and I'll touch a little bit just on adrenal immune problems, and then we'll specifically talk about low thyroid and various treatment options. So the chronic stress response, something called we call this, the stress-induced hormonal imbalance, um, but in this case it's the, it's the hormonal imbalance and its influence on thyroid function. <clears throat> so there are multiple forms of stress, physical, emotional, mental, and, and those physical stressors could be breaking a bone to an injury of some sort, a motor vehicle accident, an emotional stress, um, worry, anxiety, fear. I've seen a lot of people in my practice over the years who many times their MS started around a time of life stress. It could have been um, really a stressful event at work or a certain period of time with a family member, whatever it may be. But we certainly know there are other forms of stress. There are chemical stress from environmental pollutants, toxic drugs, vaccine reactions, infections, um, and just other factors involved. And the reason I bring this up is that the type of stress really doesn't matter when it comes to our brain's interpretation of stress because the same chemicals are released no matter what the stressful event is. And we know that for the vast majority of chronic illness that we see in our country, from diabetes to heart disease to infectious diseases to autoimmune disorders from a wide variety of things <clears throat> to osteoporosis to neurological problems. I also work with a lot of kids on the autism spectrum. Many of these kids have chronic stress, chronic fatigue, etc. The chronic stress response and the breakdown of these hormone immune detoxification systems um, is paramount to the formation of these illnesses. And so this slide really here is just sort of an overview to say, you know, that the hormone system, our metabolic system, our immune system, our neurological system is all interlinked. It's all intertwined. And through the things that we're exposed to environmentally, to the foods we eat, to the emotional state, um, it all has an impact and an influence. And it's primarily doing it through a chemical called ACTH. Um, ACTH is a chemical that's secreted by the brain 
when the brain interprets stress. Now this is kind of a busy slide, but if you just follow me here real quickly, we won't go into it real depth, but just I want to give you an idea about how things flow and how things are released in the body from a neurological standpoint. On the left bracket, we have potential sources of stress. Okay, and this, this list here is pretty obvious. No matter what that stressful event is, there is a recognition of it in our brain. And our brain releases a chemical called ACTH. ACTH tells our adrenal glands to produce cortisol. Cortisol is that hormone that helps to control inflammation, um, control the immune system, etc. And if that system, if that stressful event is acute, then essentially the release of cortisol does its thing, regulates the body, and then everybody's happy. The problem is, is with chronic stress, the adrenal cortex is, is stimulated, the production of cortisol is persistent, and we get ever increasing amounts of cortisol over time. And essentially what that does is create hormonal imbalances that start to affect blood sugar, which increases diabetes risk, heart disease risks. We start to have imbalances of hormones that affect our bones and, and fat and protein breakdown. And way here on the right, we see that this imbalance of cortisol starts to affect our immune system. And when our immune system becomes compromised, we increase the potential for infectious problems in our body, okay, whether it's yeast, viruses, bacteria, etc. <clears throat> this particular slide is showing how important this whole cortisol system is because it has its hands in every single system in our body. Again, sugar metabolism, bone health, um, our nervous system, the way we control inflammation, how our body detoxes chemicals, things that we're exposed to environmentally or things that we might produce on our own, um, the metabolism of fat and protein, and then finally the endocrine system. And way here on the right, we see that the balance of adrenal function also influences thyroid function too. One of the things that I do when I assess an individual whether they have multiple sclerosis or chronic fatigue or some other kind of issue, and I'm looking to just do a hormonal assessment, I'm always going to test adrenal function. It's so because it's it's incredibly important to the overall hormone system in general. It's interesting, many people with MS actually have elevated cortisol. Okay, so their cortisol levels are quite high because of the stress that's going on. But you can see individuals over time that <clears throat> will actually have low cortisol as their adrenals start to weaken and fatigue, and this certainly can lead to a lot of the fatigue problems that we see in our society and certainly with people um, with MS as well. The reason I bring this up is this sort of busy slide here links how the adrenals work to the thyroid. Okay, and this, let me just go through this real quickly. On the left is our brain, okay? We have this thing called the hypothalamus, and it is perceiving stress, okay? Psychological, traumatic, infectious, whatever. It's releasing chemicals to tell our pituitary gland to release this chemical called ACTH. And the ACTH tells our adrenals, hey, we need more, cort we need more cortisol. We need more cortisol to help break down protein, to make more, you know, to help regulate the body. But if you notice two things, cortisol, in directly inhibits the conversion of what's called T4 to T3. Essentially, it's blocking the way our body produces active thyroid. It also inhibits the way the pituitary releases chemicals that tell the thyroid to make thyroid hormone. So essentially, when we have an overproduction of cortisol, it's essentially turning off our thyroid. And one of the reasons it's doing that is the body is really geared towards prioritizing um, energy reserves in time of need. And because the adrenals are involved in so many different systems in the body, that what it will do when there is a lot of stress going on is it will start to slow down or turn down the volume, if you will, of thyroid function. And what does the thyroid do? Well, the thyroid is primarily involved in helping to produce 
um, metabolism, which basically produces energy. <clears throat> and we need energy to run our brain, to run our heart, to run our gut, to run our immune system, etc. Now, there are various common thyroid disorders that many people have. The most common, really, that we see in our practice is low thyroid, underactive thyroid, called hypothyroidism. An autoimmune cause of hypothyroidism is called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. But not everybody who has low thyroid has an autoimmune condition. But it's a worthwhile thing to check for. Hyperthyroidism, the overactive thyroid, the most common cause is something called Graves' disease. Now, there are people who have thyroid nodules um, that, you know, maybe are cancerous, pretty rare. And then we have something called subclinical hypothyroidism, where this is essentially somebody walking around and, you know, they're not overly fatigued or their hair's not falling out or the skin's not dry. Um, I apologize about this thing popping up here. Um, <clears throat> but they just show indicators of, of a fatiguing thyroid system. I, bold, I put here in red, stress, toxicity, and chronic illness. Um, those are major triggers for low thyroid. So who's at risk? Well, women in general are more prone to hypothyroidism than men, and, and I'll show you why, because it has to do with hormone imbalances. If there's a family history of thyroid problems, chemical exposures. We know that Chlorine and fluoride and these things called PCBs can all inhibit um, thyroid function. Um, <clears throat> if there are problems in other glands in the body, okay, if the pituitary, for example, which is in the brain, is injured, either from inflammation or the immune system or a head injury, that could lead to hypothyroidism. Um, and then you know, other substances that we might be exposed to as well could lead to the thyroid becoming low. <clears throat> times of hormonal change also predispose or is a predisposing factor to low thyroid. And so that's one reason that women obviously are more prone to hypothyroidism than men because of changes at pregnancy, changes at menopause, changes at puberty. Chronic infections. This is certainly a problem that I see a lot in autism, but anybody with a neurological disorder um, it can be a predisposing factor too or, or a contributing factor to their condition, just chronic infections in general. We'll talk about that in future, future webinars. As I mentioned before, stressful events, um, certainly. The overconsumption of certain foods, soy, um, is a major problem for many people because it's called goitrogenic. It actually can inhibit thyroid function. So sort of the overconsumption of tofu, we went through this whole tofu fad where people were eating tofu all the time, um, <clears throat> can be a problem. It's not to mean you can't have any, it just means that an overconsumption of it can be a problem. The use of synthetic estrogens, uh, again, can be a predisposing factor to low thyroid. And then if you look at the, the symptom list of hypothyroidism, um, it's quite broad. So this, honestly, some of these symptoms could actually be seen in somebody who has low adrenals, um, low adrenal function. So there is some crossover. But, you know, brittle nails or easy bruising, coarse, dry skin, um, hair loss, etc. as you can see, are all symptoms of low thyroid. Not all of them are necessarily specific to hypothyroidism, um, but they are a good indicator that the thyroid is probably under-functioning. <clears throat> so essentially, how does the thyroid work? Well, if we, if we look at the hier uh, a hierarchy pattern in the brain, we have a structure called the hypothalamus. <clears throat> and the hypothalamus is essentially responding to thyroid hormone that has been released and is circulating through the bloodstream. Okay, so it's, it's sort of like a, a sensor. It senses whether the level is high or the level is low. If it senses the level of thyroid hormone in circulation is low, it sends a chemical called TRH, thyroid-releasing hormone. It sends this chemical to the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland is sitting there, and it takes in the TRH, and it says, oh, 
I need to make I need to tell the thyroid to make some thyroid hormone. So the pituitary gland then secretes this thyroid stimulating hormone, and then the thyroid gland responds in kind by producing what's called T4 and T3. <clears throat> T4 essentially is a larger pool of thyroid that a certain percentage of it is then converted into T3. And it's the T3 that is the active form at the cell level. The liver and peripheral tissues in the body actually help in this conversion. <clears throat> okay, so T4 is then converted into T3 through the liver and through what's, what's called peripheral tissues in the body. One of the problems that can happen is a conversion of T4 to T3. The major conversion problem is stress, okay? And as we saw from the slide before, cortisol can actually inhibit that. So elevated cortisol can lead to a conversion problem. But so can chronic illness of many different forms or somebody who's in a fasting state. Heavy metal exposure, um, one of the converting enzymes that make this T4 to T3 conversion happen is selenium. And so people can run a deficit of selenium deficiency. <clears throat> and again, we're back to this sort of busy slide. But as you see here, we can see we have the hypothalamus, which tells the pituitary, which tells the thyroid to make more hormone. But if we're producing a lot of cortisol, this system is blocked. Now it's interesting, look at the T4 to T3 conversion. What happens when T4 to T3 is blocked because of cortisol, the T4 has to do something, okay? And the T4 ends up getting converted into something called reverse T3. Reverse T3 is inactive T3, but it kind of looks like T3. And so what will happen is reverse T3 will, will block any T3 that gets produced. And it's interesting because reverse T3 will actually feed back to the hypothalamus and telling the hypothalamus reads that T3 as, oh, we have enough thyroid hormone, so therefore I don't need to continue to send these signals to the pituitary. And so the system shuts down from above. <clears throat> so all of these things can be tested. So standard lab testing for low thyroid minimally should include a TSH, which is a thyroid stimulating hormone, T4, specifically as I put here in red, free T4, and free T3. Why do I say free? Well, what happens is, is whenever the body produces a hormone, it's producing it in, in a, uh, a form that's bound to a protein, a carrier protein. So the, these proteins in the blood kind of taxi these, these chemicals around, these hormones around. And then a certain percentage of it is peeled off and it becomes free. Okay, And free means it's physiologically active. It's, it's ready to do its work. And we know that the free T3 is the active form at the cell level. We can also look at reverse T3 um, to see if that's being produced, and that certainly can link back to chronic stress. And then if we're interested in looking to see, is the immune system involved at all in affecting thyroid function, we called anti-TPO and thyroglobulin antibodies. By the way, all of these tests are available from any standard lab. Okay, So you can talk to your doctor and say, hey, I want to test TSH free T3, free T4, and reverse T3. Most doctors will just look at TSH, and it's not enough. It's not enough information, okay? Um, and they'll assume just because it's normal that T4 and T3 must be normal too. But as we can tell, you know, we go back and look at this slide here, it's not enough, you know, because we could have inefficient TSH and, not, and our thyroid could be affected, or we could have a problem way up high in the hypothalamus, or we might have a problem in the pituitary itself. Okay, so we need to get adequate data. There is another test that was used in the past quite often called the thyroid-releasing hormone test. Now, 
thyroid releasing hormone test is not done that often anymore, um, <clears throat> but it is a very good way of trying to figure out is the thyroid issue at a higher level, somewhere up deeper in the brain? Is it at the pituitary level? Is it possibly at the hypothalamus level? What's going on? Okay, so this has sort of regained some interest over the past couple of years. And essentially what the TR TRH test is, is you have to go to a doctor's office and they will actually um, take a small amount of blood initially and they'll test the TSH levels. Then they'll give you a small amount of this TRH given um, as an infusion into your vein. And about every 20 to 30 minutes for a couple times thereafter, they'll draw some blood to test the TSH level, the thyroid stimulating hormone level. If the thyroid stimulating hormone level increases just fine, then they basically say, hey, everything's good. It looks like the system's working. If the TSH gets delayed or is absent when it's being stimulated by this, by this hormone, then there's certainly a problem in that system. Uh, and sometimes that means they've got to go and look a little bit deeper, look at other pituitary hormones, um, do a further assessment. <clears throat> so that is an option for some people. Now, there's a few things called diiodinases. Now, these aren't necessarily tested um, for, but these are just sort of important to kind of have an understanding from a discussion standpoint. Essentially, what diiodinases are is they are converting enzymes, okay? And there's a bunch of different types. The reason I bring this up is <clears throat> that if we have a thyroid problem that is occurring because of a heavy metal problem, uh, mercury, for example, sequestering selenium, we might have a difficulty in converting our T4 to T3. If we have a lot of stress and cortisol and adrenal imbalances, that too can affect these converting enzymes from functioning properly. And so <clears throat> this is one of the reasons that when, when I look to do a thyroid assessment, I don't just stop there. I also want to look at the adrenals and put that entire system together. Now it's interesting because again, chronic stress from inflammation to infections to mental emotional, whatever it is, will affect the thyroid. So what are some different treatments of hypothyroidism? Well, diet and lifestyle is key. It's interesting because diet and lifestyle is also key for adrenal fatigue. Certainly diet is helpful for people with autoimmune and inflammatory disorders. Certainly have seen people improve um, with addition, some of the symptoms when we put them on a gluten-free diet. So that should be something that's looked into. Um, we could do detoxification therapies if there's heavy metals. Those certainly need to be dealt with. Chronic infections, allergies, providing nutrients. It's not always just about giving thyroid. It's about, from an integrative medicine standpoint, what else is going on in the body that we need to look at here to try to get an overall improvement in healing. <clears throat> but there are some certain nutrients that people can take um, to help the adrenals function, excuse me, help the thyroid function better. Selenium, for one, as I mentioned, remember selenium is really important because it helps with those enzymes to convert the inactive, the active thyroid. Iodine is important. The thyroid actually needs iodine um, in order to make thyroid hormone. But we have to be cautious. We don't want to use too much. So, you know, typically, you know, I say here 55, 45 to 50 micrograms, but most supplements you get who have a, a selenium in it anywhere between 50 to 100 micrograms a day. Iodine between 200 and 500 micrograms a day. Tyrosine is a specific amino acid that's actually used in the thyroid to, to make thyroid hormone. Coconut oil is a wonderful nutrient, very healthy for the thyroid itself. Um, so one to two tablespoons per day is great. And then there are various glandular products um, that can be used to support the thyroid, the pituitary, uh, and the hypothalamus. <clears throat> a number of herbs have been used, and, and I don't have a specific um, one supplement for these herbal remedies, but kelp, we certainly know, has a lot of iodine. 
some of these other herbs too. Most of the time when we're talking about like a, a thyroid support herb pro, herbal product is just a combination of these different things. So those things are out there and do exist. But then we get into more standard treatment, okay? Um, and what we try to do in our, in our practice is work with more natural hormones or, or natural thyroid, what's called desiccated thyroid. These are porcine um, thyroid compounds. They contain not only the T4, but they also contain T3, the active, and a number of different cofactors. And there's a lot of different brand names. Armor Thyroid, West Thyroid, um, Nature Thyroid. Armor Thyroid being the most common. And <clears throat> Armor Thyroid, as most of these, these brand names, are about 20% T3 and about 80% T4. So our body naturally produces T4 at a higher concentration, and then from that, <clears throat> we get a conversion to T3, okay? Now, some people are sensitive to these things, so we can actually have thyroid compounded as well. The beautiful thing about compounding and working with a compounding pharmacy is you can really make your own product. You can, you can, you can make your own amount depending on what is specifically needed based on symptom improvement and lab testing. So um, many of these, these, uh, these natural thyroid products work extremely well and have a lot of flexibility in dosing. And then, of course, there are synthetic medications as well. These are often used by conventional doctors, and, and honestly, some people get a lot of help from them. I mean, Synthroid, Levothroid are very common. You notice that the synthroid is T4. So here, here's what I want to point out. A lot of people who are diagnosed with hypothyroidism are actually put on synthroid. And they may feel better, but often feel better if they're added, if somebody gives them a little bit of additional T3. Because what the doctor is assuming is that T4 is going to get converted to T3, but that doesn't always happen for people. Cytomel is another medication, synthetic um, thyroid, that is primarily just T3, so it's going to be a little bit more physiologically active. But most people guaranteed who have low thyroid, they're either given Synthroid or Levothyroid, um, and it's only the T4. That's why we like things like Armor, because it's a combination of T4 and T3. <clears throat> So what are some improvements that can happen with thyroid therapy? Well, improvement in focus and attention, um, increased mental energy and, and memory, improved cardiovascular muscular, muscular fitness. In my experience with people with MS, they've had all of these and more. Oftentimes, um, particularly with respects to fatigue, you know, less fatigue, um, less regressions. Um, you know, there, many times their heat intolerance diminishes, there's a cognitive improvement, they can think more clearly, etc. So it's not to indicate that low thyroid is a cure-all, or excuse me, treating thyroid is a cure-all for MS, but if you have multiple sclerosis and you also have low thyroid function, you're going to feel that much worse. It's critically important to deal with these underlying deficiencies to just improve the health and vitality of the body. I apologize for this thing popping up here on the screen. There's nothing I can do about it right now. It's obviously my computer's trying to tell me if I want to change color configuration. So we're just ignoring it. We are available, my partner and I, for consultations. Um, I have worked with people with, with MS and other neurological disorders for many years. I also work a lot with kids on the autism spectrum. I do what's called functional diagnostic uh, assessment, thyroid, hormone, adrenal, uh, as well as my partner. My partner, Dr. Trancatella, well-versed in women's health and hormones, uh, works a lot with hormonal imbalances, does the same type of testing as far as thyroid and adrenal testing as well, um, works with detoxification programs, for adults with chronic illness. So if you'd like to get more information, you can go to mysunrisecenter.com or call 951-461-4800. <clears throat> and then, of course, 
if you have further questions, you want to interact with me more directly, very inexpensively, through uh, askthedoctor-ms.com, I would encourage you to check this website out. It's $27 a month. Um, there's no long-term contracts. Um, you can join for a month and and you know, quit the membership if you'd like. Um, your choice. So again, ask the doctor dash ms dot com. I hope this was uh, useful information for you. Uh, perhaps if you're thinking you might have low thyroid function, um, you can always you know, definitely contact your doctor and say, hey, at least give me some TS, uh, do a TSH, a free T3, and a free T4 level. Okay, everybody, thanks so much, and we will see you next time. Thank you. The organizer has ended the session and this call will be disconnected.